I was thinking on the way up here <clears throat> about this gathering, and then this is the fourth year of this gathering. I was thinking about it in terms of the four rounds of the sweat houses. I understand them, and I know many people have different understandings, but where <clears throat> what I was taught by the elders that I learned the sweat from was that the first round of the sweat is about purifying yourself, purifying your heart. It's kind of that first year we had all kinds of sweat lodges going, there was a lot of purification happening. The second year is about, you know, praying for each other as people. In the case, especially the, the men and women praying for each other. The third round is a round of healing. That was last year. That was a tough one. A lot of healing was occurring. It was a hard, was a hard year. The first two years were pretty pretty good. The last year was a little harder because healing was happening. Coming together after a long time of separation is not easy. And this is the fourth year, the year of Thanksgiving. Be thankful. And I'm very thankful that the gathering is still occurring, is still here. We're still in this land following the many dreams and some of the when Mike was speaking and one of the, some of the things he didn't tell you is all the dreams and personal visions of people, some of whom are sitting in the circle today that over the last 25 or 30 years that has led to this gathering. <clears throat> in 1981, I came here with a, uh, a woman who wanted to visit the tribes of North America who came from Israel and her name was Rehia Kanum and she asked me to come here to the village of Lilwat with her, so I did. And um, when we were getting ready to to meet with the leaders and the, the band council of this community, I was wondering how I was going to introduce her. And I I seen a, a newspaper with a little article about the peacekeeper, the founder of the Iroquois Confederacy, the person that brought a great peace. And I I used that to explain who she was, and we we spoke. And then um, years went by, 20, 25 years went by, and I was called back to this community and they said, uh, you know, there's been many dreams, there's been many visions, what should we do? And the decision that was made by the elders council and the leaders of this community and the chiefs here was to was to have this gathering, kind of bring people together. And um, <clears throat> there's really only two things I want to talk about today and a little bit of that history. And last year we, we did a, a ceremony here, myself and Phil, that <clears throat> Phil Lane was going to be speaking in a minute. And um, we had the great blessing, as we have again this year, of having Crazy Horse's pipe uh, here on the grounds. And Phil will talk about that, and it would be brought forward. Um, in 19, I think it was around 1983, 1984, my oldest daughter, uh, who's now 27 or 28, so that was about uh, 24 years ago, I think, um, was going to be getting her Indian name at the Kamloops powwow and a little bit before that that gathering happened the powwow gathering happened I had a dream where the ancestors asked me to do the name giving a little differently and to include all the four peoples that are represented by these flags out here the four peoples and the, the, the sky and the earth and to to invite uh, uh, in the eastern door of the arbor a native elder man and woman to come and in the dream the phrase was used to be as godparents to your daughter and in the southern door of the arbor to ask an Asian man and woman to come and in the western door of the arbor to ask an African man and an African woman to come and in the northern door to ask a white man and a white woman to come so that your children will feel they said in the dream related to all people and so we carried this out for each of our children and if, uh, I don't know if any of you were there, I think there's probably some people here that were there at those giveaways uh, when my children got their, their Indian names, but the Lytton drum group was the drum group that sang for the first two name givings for my two oldest daughters. And we carried that out, and <clears throat> last year, before we came here to this gathering, we another dream came to advise to to do that same ceremony here as a way of bringing ourselves together. It's, a, it's time for us to become relatives again and to realize that we are, you know, one human family. And it's a struggle after, after 500 hard years, after hundreds of years of residential schools, after a bounty system in the eastern United States where 
my family's from originally where native people were hunted and the bounty on a native man was 100 pounds sterling. The bounty on a native woman was 50 pounds sterling. The bounty on a native child was 50 pounds sterling. People were making money by hunting us down and killing us. <clears throat> it was a long and a hard history. And, but it's amazing that despite this 500 year hard time, those flags are still at the middle of the arbor here. Think about that. that these are our people here. And if you happen to travel in native country this summer, if you go to a Sundance in Montana, or you go to ceremonies in New Mexico, or you go to a gathering in Saskatchewan, or Manitoba, those flags will be there in almost every community and every place you go. I moved to Canada in 1979 to help develop Round Lake, and if you come to Round Lake Treatment Center in Vernon, those flags will be there. They have been, the, the people have held on to the teachings despite great difficulty. The teachings of our oneness, that is an amazing gift of knowledge. The gift of knowledge that has been carried down from the beginning to now, that people have held on to and, and carried it through a long, hard winter, carried it through a long, dark night, and they've held on to these teachings, and so we have those flags there. No matter who you are sitting in this arbor today, you are represented there. And I guarantee you that in Native nations across the United States and Canada, of which is about 3,000 <coughs> Native communities in North America, every one of those people that are represented by those flags out there will be prayed for this year, as they have been every year for a long time. And um, when I was a young man and I was feeling kind of angry about things and treaty rights and everything else, injustices on every side. I ask an elder, why do we continue putting these flags up? Why do we continue making prayers for people that are ripping us off? And the elder said, didn't you ever notice when you pray for people they show up? Everybody has come here from every nation and every people in the world, world, people have come here to walk in this land because we held on to the lodge. There was a sweat house in Africa at one time. There was a sweat house in Europe. Now there's a remnant called Asana. They did have the sweat house and the pipe in Asia. Everybody was given the sweat and the pipe in the beginning, but we held on. That's why everyone just came here because these flags are still still here. When our Swiss relatives came from Switzerland to one of our gatherings here in North America and they seen these flags, they said, oh, we used to have these, but, but we lost them. The culture of Europe was devastated by alcoholism and through alcohol, they, they lost a lot of their lodge and a lot of their teachings. And the man from Switzerland told us, you're to reteach us this, you're to give it back to us. Brother Phil was mentioning on the way up here that we have to have the maturity to, to be each other's teachers. We can all learn from each other. Every one of the four peoples has a specific knowledge that they are keepers of and responsible for. In the case of native people, we are, I believe we are the keepers of the earth and the things that grow from the earth. The teachings of the plants and the foods. That's why the Irish potato comes from here. The Italian tomato comes from here. All peppers come from here. Eight out of 10 foods that people eat. I watched a show on TV just last month. I was changing channels and I came across this show on the traditional foods of India. And since I have a research garden and I'm really interested in herbals and medicines, I thought I'd watch it. The first traditional food of India was corn. I thought corn, hey, corn comes from here. They could not have had it more than 500 years, but now it's a traditional food of India. The second traditional food of India was beans. Hey, beans. I'm an Iroquois, we have beans. The third uh, traditional food of India was peppers. All peppers come from here. All five foods that were the traditional foods of India come from here. That's, that was our gift. That was, that was our responsibility, our guardianship from the beginning of time and the teachings that 
Chief, Chief Michael Leach talked about just now. The responsibility and the special uh, guardianship of the African brothers and sisters was water, is water. The healing power of water for the blessing and healing of the human beings. The special teachings of the Asian brothers and sisters was the wind, especially as it comes into the body as breath. The power of meditation and yoga, yoga, the science of breath. For the spiritual advancement of humanity, they were given that responsibility. And the responsibility of the white brothers and sisters, the responsibility of fire, to keep the fire. Fire has the amazing capacity to move and also to consume. The capital of Switzerland is burn, keepers of the fire. <laughs> Anyway, so it's amazing we are here. And as we said last year, and as Michael confirmed for me this year, last year we received the message that we're standing at the door of the fifth world. We really need to let go of as much of the hurt, as much of the things that separate us as human beings as we can. I know that many of you have been through those things, and I have too. And I'm working on myself as much as I can to let go of the hurt that we receive down through the generations that we are carrying for what our ancestors went through. I read this amazing book called The Heart Code, which is about heart transplant patients. It was written by a psychoneuroimmunologist who worked with heart transplants. You know, scientists at the University of British Columbia, where I work, say that the heart is a muscle. It cannot think, does not have feeling. But I think that almost every elder at this gathering has probably one time in their life spoken about heart knowledge. You never hear an elder when you go to give a talk say, be sure and speak from your mind. <laughs> they always say, be sure and speak from your heart. We believe the heart is a thinking and feeling organ that has a consciousness and awareness. And in this book, The Heart Code, there was an unfortunate case of a 10-year-old girl that received a heart transplant from another 10-year-old girl who unfortunately had been murdered. When she received that heart, she began to dream about the murder, including the actual name of the murderer. That knowledge was in the heart of the girl that had been murdered. Think of the knowledge that is in our heart for what our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents have went through upon this earth. But it's time for us to heal that as much as we can. Not to pretend it's not there, that just makes it worse but to consciously heal it and consciously let it go, all the sufferings that, that we have been through, let them go and embrace each other, which is a hard thing to do after all this history. But I'm absolutely convinced that we will either survive together or not at all. We are not gonna go on upon this world unless we can come together. And that brings me to the last thing I wanna talk about. <clears throat> I want to talk about what Mother Earth is going through. I work in health at UBC and one of the things I sometimes work with are, is palliative care. When a patient is put in palliative care, it means that the end is near beyond any doubt. If you're in palliative care and you have a heart attack, no effort will be made to revive the patient. And I believe myself that right now, Mother Earth is in palliative care. What happens to a patient in palliative care in the last days of their life? Their fever elevates. Today we call that global warming. Global warming is the fever of Mother Earth as she suffers from the sickness of the economic development that has happened in the world. Sometimes in palliative care, towards the end, the last few days of people's lives, their hair will fall out, or a lot of it will fall out. That is the death of the trees. If you go up here into the Coquihalla, as far as you can see, the trees are dying. I just learned last week that 95% of the elm trees in the eastern United States have disappeared from illness. That's an entire tree people decimated. 
the death of the trees is Mother Earth's hair falling out. And I don't know if you've been with people at the very, very end. I, I have many times. And sometimes, sometimes they shake. With certain illnesses, the body will shake to try to throw off the fever. There's a, there's a shaking that happens before passing. And in our prophecies, that is called the third shaking of Mother Earth that is coming soon. When, as Mike said, the Earth will survive. Our elders have told us that all along. But the Earth may have to shake to save herself. And there will be a shaking of the Earth because we have violated in this world an understanding that nearly every indigenous people have. And that, that understanding is this, that the Earth is a finite system. The earth is a finite system, as is a human body. Any perpetual growth in the human body is a cancer. That's what a cancer is. A cancer cell is a cell that doesn't die. And the goal of almost all of our politicians in the world is growth. I heard him on the TV last night. If I'm elected, there will be growth. I heard, uh, what's his name, that's running against Obama talking about it. My first business as President of the United States, he said, will be to ensure economic growth, which to me is environmental cancer. Any growth in a finite system creates destruction and, destruction and death. I think that most indigenous people understand that in a finite system, the only thing you can do to better your life is to strengthen the system. I gotta tell you, when Europeans came here, right here to this place right here, this was a strong system. There were so many salmon in that river down there, they almost pushed each other out onto the bank. There was old growth trees. The air was clean. The water was good. The plants and herbs that people needed to eat were being cultivated and harvested in different places around here. And there was a huge resource of food where now there's scarcity. There's scarcity because we've embraced the illusion of growth, which really can't occur in a finite system. This idea that we've had since the 1700s, since the Adam Smith wrote the book called The Wealth of Nations, and since John Locke wrote a book called The Treatise on Government, this idea that we can have an infinite growth in a finite system, that's just not possible. But the illusion is created and financed by debt, the debt of nations, that we now see that so many nations of the world have so much debt, they're struggling under and struggling with that debt to to maintain the illusion of this growth, this so-called growth, which is just really an illusion, but it's a very destructive illusion. And in order to maintain that illusion that things are growing and expanding, which cannot possibly happen in a finite system, we extract minerals, we, we export oil, we uh, cut down all the old growth timber. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know if Phil remembers this, but in Washington State one time, we, we got a deal with the government where we were gonna get a you know, a thousand acres of, of old growth timber for a traditional native sanctuary. And when we looked around the state, there was hardly any old growth timber left. There was, there was not a thousand acres of old growth timber in the entire state. It's gone. All to create and sustain the illusion that there can be growth in a finite system, which simply is impossible. We have to reorient ourselves to sustainable values. And I myself believe that many of the traditional people around the earth, the indigenous people of Africa and Asia, and even the indigenous people of Europe, the, the Sami people and the indigenous people of North and South America, have these values which are sustainable, which we can have a really good life together. We don't have to have, you know, 10 visas and a line of credit to survive. <laughs> that all that is an illusion. And, uh, we need to really return and look at the system that we're in and think about how that we can strengthen it. Last year, the university did an a ex excavation in Broad Inlet. They had to go down eight feet to get the dirt. They had to go eight feet to get the dirt. Eight feet of sludge, toxic chemicals, crap. How long is it gonna take us to clean that up? To clean up this system, to purify it? As we enter the fifth world, our first job is a purification. Our elders call the, the third shaking, the shaking of the earth to save itself at, at the end of this cycle that Michael spoke of, the purification of all things.
time to embrace that purification by purification, purifying ourselves as much as we can, by purifying that which is around us. It's so difficult in the city of Vancouver to really get non-GMO good food. To just get one good dinner of organic food. I'm lucky that I work at the UBC Garden, so I have access to organic food. To be able to eat what is good for us. To be able to embrace water and food as medicine. Food is our medicine. The food and herbs that we have are our medicines that we eat. That is, our, that is the best source of medicine that we have. And to strengthen this system and re-strengthen this system as we are in, in it. I went with, uh, with Phil a couple years ago to a major environmental conference in Eastern Canada. There were very important people there who had written many books on the environment. And I heard speaker after speaker get up and say, we can still have growth, but it would be green growth. You know? And I think to myself, you know, that ain't happening. They're just perpetuating, the, they're trying to feel good about the illusion that they're perpetuating. And I, and at that, that meeting, I was sitting there, I think, with Alex Ahinikyu, I don't know if he's still here, and some of the uh, brothers from Saskatchewan in the, in the back of the room, and I was thinking to myself, man, I wish all these guys in the front would just sit down and let these elders in the back get up and talk. Because they cannot continue, you cannot save the earth with the same set of values that is destroying the earth. It's just not going to happen. We need to get back to the indigenous values. We need to humble ourselves. And right, we are going to be humbled as a people in this world fairly quickly. We're going to be humbled through the environmental and economic collapses that are going to occur. We will be humbled to humble ourselves and to bring ourselves back to the earth, you know, the teachings of the earth and the things that grow from the earth, and to create a sustainable system. <clears throat> when I think about the fact that the Plains Indians from Texas on up to Edmonton, Alberta, strengthen the system by creating a buffalo herd of 60 million buffalo. It took three months for the, the herd to pass a single point as it moved towards the tree line just past Edmonton, then it turned around and went back to Texas. And all the tribes in that area had a wealth of food to eat. And in just one or two years, Buffalo Bill and his friends reduced those buffalo from 60 million, from 60 million to eight, not eight million, Eight. 60 million buffalo, except for eight, were destroyed almost overnight. You know? And what a, what a wonderful understanding there was in those plains of developing resource. What a wonderful understanding there was in this Fraser River system of developing and maintaining the salmon as a resource and a food for people. Some of my friends here from this very village have told me that quite a few of the salmon they get out of the rivers have gross on them now. They're throwing back, not healthy. That's an example of what I mean by devastating the finite system to create the illusion of growth. You know, salmon was the big growth in the industry in, in, in uh, British Columbia in the early 1900s, late 1800s. It was just an illusion and all it really did was destroy part of the finite system that we live in. But now we have to restrengthen that. So anyway, that's my that's my soapbox for the day. <laughs> I want to close by acknowledging the people of this area. I want to express acknowledgement and respect for the chiefs and elders and leaders of this area. I want to express acknowledgement acknowledgement and respect for the countless generations of people that have lived here and for, for being invited to, to come to this unceded territory, the unceded territory of the, the Little What Nation, I hope I'm saying that right, and to be able just to be to walk here on this land is, is a privilege. I appreciate being here. Thank you for listening, all my relations.